Hello class, welcome to the week two lab tool demo. This week we start diving into disassembly using IDA Pro. So what is IDA Pro? Well, it's a lot of things. Uh, first and foremost, for what we'll be using for the purposes of this class, it's a disassembler. It's also a debugger. From the disassembly standpoint, uh, IDA Pro explores binary programs for which a source code isn't always available. Uh, to create maps of the binary's execution. When we look at it from a malware analysis standpoint, the real interest of a disassembler is that it shows the instructions that are actually executed by the processor in a symbolic representation known as the assembly language. Now the assembly language uh, can be very uh, intimidating for anyone that has never seen it before. It is a new land, new territory. But if we look at the executables within inside of a program like IDA Pro, a disassembler like IDA Pro can make the assembly language much easier to make sense of, which makes everyone's day much better. So we use IDA Pro starting this week to introduce you to one, a tool that is used commonly in the industry for malware analysis and then two to start using it as a jumping off point into the assembly language. Now we're using the free version. It is available in your tools folder on your 540 malware analysis VM. So for the next few moments just want to uh, get you folks set up as you embark on this journey of looking at executables and looking at the assembly language and really just to familiarize you with the core features of the free edition of IDA Pro and uh, show you some navigation how to get yourself around the tool and just to get a, a decent uh, proficiency on using the tool itself. So here I am uh, on the jumping off screen, the home screen if you will, uh, for IDA Pro. Now there are several ways that we can go about to start the disassembly process uh, first and foremost, we have to um, bring in the actual executable that we're going to be examining. Now, there are uh, one of two ways you can do that. You can go to File and then Open, or you can just go right out to wherever it is that you have, more than likely your infected folder uh, for this particular class. And I have a program, an executable here, just called uh, Evil Program. I can drag it and drop it right into uh, IDA and we can get get started that way again drag a file here to uh, disassemble and with that you would just go ahead and actually accept all of the defaults and press OK and it starts to go to work now what I want to take a few moments is to go over some of the tabs here at the top so at the top here uh, you have IDA view, hex view and then we see what's called exports. Okay, the export tab shows any exported functions. Okay, so this is normally populated only with something uh, other than the start, as you see here in a DLL. So the exports tab uh, displays the APIs, the application program interfaces, uh, also known as functions, uh, that are actually um, exported by the program. Then we move over and we see imports. Imports tab displays the functions used by the program that are contained in what are called external libraries. And then moving down the line here we see what's uh, called functions. One note before we go into functions regarding the imports I want to make is the functions are um, based on when we look at the functionality of malware we can infer some of the malware's functionality by examining the functions okay and based on the functions imported by the malware we can actually start looking at some of the capabilities now there is Microsoft documentation out there that gives a good listing uh, about the API's it's some worthy reading if you want to go out and pull that down and actually do uh, pull down the installable package that contains the MSDN documentation uh, from the Microsoft website. Maybe you're going to use that in a offline setting where internet connectivity is, uh, isn't advised. 
So going down again uh, the line looking at functions, the functions tab shows us the number of functions in the program that Ida was able to identify. Okay, And this can help us determine the, the size of the program under analysis. Okay, So just looking at this particular instance, this gives us an idea of what was actually uh, parsed out, identified by Ida, okay, f by function. And from there, we can look at it and see just a general relative size, okay? So in general, it takes obviously more work for us to reverse engineer something um, that would have 200 functions versus something that would have 100. Obviously, we're not looking at anywhere close to 100 here. Again, this is just used as a demo for the for the uh, class uh, week two demo for your tool. Um, don't forget though that the number of functions identified also might include what are called library functions that are linked into the program. Now when we examine the functions there's a number of flags that you'll see here um, across the top and they represent uh, different um, labeling purposes if you will um, for the particular functions that are found or parsed out by Ida. Okay, so there's a number of flags there that might be present in your display. Um, the common ones here, if you look at L, uh, that's a library function. Uh, looking at T, uh, that's type information. If you're not quite sure uh, what these stand for and not understanding their functionality, there is a help feature. So if you go up into the help feature, you can actually go into the help index and you can actually go out and search for the open uh, functions window and it'll give you some good information about the actual uh, flags himself. So if we look at a particular function here we'll just go with uh, 401171. I'm just going to double click this now when I double click that, that's actually jumping me to what's now called uh, the subroutine. Okay, so this this functions tab is really a, a good convenient central location for program navigation. So by selecting any of the functions like I just did 401171, I double clicked it. By selecting that, you're instantly taken to that location. Okay and most of our static code or reverse engineering is performed at this level, at the function level, meaning that functions are analyzed for meaning first and when we know that, when we find out what the purpose is of that function, the relationships and interaction between the functions can be more easily determined. So at any time, if you're in this screen after you've double clicked on a particular function and you want to return back to your previous location, there's two ways you can do that. Up at the top you can actually go and hit the back button which is here or you can just simply hit the escape button which brings you back and that's your choice whichever way you want to navigate that now when we look at this particular uh, function we are now what's in called the text view okay so we can examine this inside of text view or if you're more graphically inclined you can go to what's called a graph view and simply the way to navigate between or toggle between text view and graph view is to hit your spacebar. Okay, so going between graph view and text view, and you can drag this uh, these boxes around you know, as much as you like, and you can certainly um, customize how you want things to look. Okay, so this is the graph view, and again, just depending on what you want and what's easier for you. The graph view typically is better for visualizing loops and complex conditionals within the function. The text view, and you can have both. I mean, if you want to minimize and bring these next to each other, you certainly can do that. But you can toggle back and forth in between there. Um, the, the text view is more compact. It's easier for some people to actually actually navigate. That is, uh, that is your choice there. Keep in mind, um, with your graph view, okay, these are divided into blocks, okay, and this again helps really visualize the flow of the program. And these blocks, uh, they can be moved, okay, and collapsed, and you can customize that.
If I switch back to my text view and start scrolling down, I'll eventually come across um, some arrows there. Okay. Now, when I start looking at the arrows, and you can see them vaguely here, okay, the the arrows on this left-hand side of the listing here shows the destination of the jump instructions. Okay, so there's only one arrow per jump. Okay, in the text view. Now, if you were in the graph view, there would be two, and that's mainly because when a conditional jump is not taken, execution simply continues at the next instruction. Now, if we're staying within this uh, four zero. 1171, we look at the code and the IDA view tab here. When we try to understand the purpose of this function, you might wonder which other function it is capable of invoking. Now, to determine this, you could literally scroll through um, each one of these, each through uh, each assembly instruction here, and look for uh, a call statement like you see here. Okay. That's one way. A more convenient way, a more efficient way to do that is actually bring up what's called the function call tab or window. Now to accomplish this, you go up to the view menu, open subviews, and then we go over and we click on function calls. Now from there, you would see a screen like this one here, and this is just listing out the function calls. The top portion here uh, would actually show you calls to functions defined inside the programs that we're reverse engineering and the functions here the bottom part of the window show calls to to external functions which are typically system or API calls such as uh, you know get module file name write a file create a file which the program uses to interact with the environment so when you find a function uh, going through and looking at your static analysis, the obvious question is under what conditions is this function actually called? And that's that's true if it contains functionality that you didn't see when you performed your behavioral analysis, which we'll do later, or your dynamic analysis, which is coming up next week. So to determine um, where where an item in IDA, whether it's a code, a string, or variable, is referenced, you actually highlight the label by single clicking it like we just did there okay and pressing what's uh, next is the X key okay and it'll tell you at the bottom that it's been finished okay or I can go up to view again open sub views and I can then go to cross references and in this case where I clicked did not have any other cross references but I can go through and again uh, hit X or go up to view open sub views, cross references, and so forth. So basically with that you would be presented with a list of locations that the item um, or, or the code is referenced from. And again, once you're there, you can actually examine it by double clicking it. And as, as you see there, I hit the X button, which is the same as going up to the view and sub views. So I can actually double click this which will navigate me straight to that location and when I want to go back to my original location again I can hit the back button like you would typically see on a browser or hit escape so that's locating references related to that particular function now lastly jumping to an address so in the Ida view so I go to my Ida view tab here I'll just press the G key okay the G key allows me to jump to a specific address. Okay, so I enter an address here. I'm just going to type in 14012 alpha 2. Okay, and you'll see a lot of times in reverse engineering, you may have to um, actually go to a specific location, and you may have questions that come up in future labs for that as well. A quick way of doing that again is that G key if you're in the IW view here. So I just want to jump to that particular location and I will actually see a call here that is for a reg set value EXA used by the malware which is used to in this particular situation to disable the user account control pop-up dialog.